This Factor bike costs 60 grand, $60,000. Now it's a high performance track bike, but we're gonna tell you why we think this bike is so ridiculously expensive. And it is not what you think. Before we go any further, if you like what we do and learning about the latest bike tech, then well, be sure to subscribe as it helps us grow and improve and make better videos for you, which you can enjoy for free. Now this bike is ridiculously expensive and it's pretty common for people to be complaining about the fact that your everyday bikes are costing in excess of 10,000 pounds. But this bike is off the charts, especially when you take a look at the picture of it on the website. Oh, I mean, where do I begin? <laughs> Look at just how it's presented. It's got no chain ring on oh. it. The chain is just shoddily draped over the chainstay. It's got no pedals and yeah. the crank's in a funny position. And well, I mean, look, it doesn't even appear to have any paint on it. It just looks like a scruffy prototype. Also, what is actually going on with the background? It looks like it's been photographed next to like some old marquee or something. I mean, bikes which are like a hundredth of the price still have nicely presented what look like professional grade photographs to advertise them in a good way. Just a quick note to add in, at the time of recording, the Factor Disgust did look that way on the website. However, after making this video, they've subsequently presented it with new photos. However, the outrageous price and lack of any details justifying that cost remain. Although there is now a section where you can input your email and register for interest. It's almost like they don't actually want us to buy it. So, in a bid to find out, we're gonna call them up, try and see if we can buy it. Oh, yeah. One right. important thing to take note of is the bike does appear to have a UCI sticker on it, which is important because it means that technically anyone at home and us should be able to buy it. But we don't have $60,000. Let's just ring up and risk it. Um, should we phone the Factor US office? What time is it in America right now? I literally have no idea. I'm literally so nervous. Welcome to the messaging service. Personal call. It is quite literally like no one wants us to be able to buy it. Right, we're ringing them back. It's ringing. Welcome to the messaging service. What's someone got to do to buy a $60,000 bike? Okay, so that turned out to be an absolutely huge failure. So I think we should have a quick recap. It would appear there's this ridiculously expensive $60,000 bike available online. It's shoddily presented and whilst it is technically available, it seems that it's not actually that simple to try and buy. So why on earth would a brand do this? Huh. I'm glad you asked, Alex. See this looks like it's a track bike, a very high performance looking track bike. And you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to come to the conclusion that a bike like this has probably been created with one purpose in mind, the Olympics. Now national federations are all in a tech arms race for the Olympics and they often work with brands to develop what they believe is the fastest bike and is gonna win medals. And they don't want other federations getting this advantage that they believe they have. So, you know, they don't want them to just log on to Wiggle and order one on next day delivery. But there's a problem here. The UCI rules. Bear with me. The UCI rules states that in Article 1.3.006, equipment shall be of a type that is sold for use by anyone practicing cycling as a sport. Any equipment in development phase and not yet available for sale, brackets prototype, must be subject to an authorization request to the UCI equipment unit before its use. Authorization. Fine, ranging from 5,000 to 100,000 Swiss francs. Text modified, 15th of the 10th. 2018. All right. Good story, bro. <laughs> Anyhow, this rule means that kit has to be commercially available and able to be sold, which means brands also have to list this stuff for sale, even though they don't actually want to and aren't that fussed about selling it. 
Yeah, I mean, top-end Olympic track bike is what's known in marketing terms as a halo product. It's the cycling equivalent of a Formula One car or a, a hypercar. Brands use these things to kind of advertise their brand and, and make their brand name look good. Um, but they're a niche product. They're never intended to sell in huge numbers. And brands make money by selling more affordable bikes that the, the rest of us buy in far greater volume. The other thing is that national federations, as mentioned, will often pay brands or commission brands to help make them a bike for the Olympics. Mm. And so they will contribute to the R&D of that bike. Thinking along the lines of, say, the Hope Lotus bike and British Cycling. Yeah, great example. It's quite a strange rule, really, because imagine if, say, the FIA in Formula One said that, hey, look, teams, all of these Formula One cars that you've made now have to be commercially available. It would be bonkers. That would be crazy. <laughs> Now I can see the other side of the coin as to why it exists. So it's there for a number of reasons. First one, to stop teams or nations turning up on race day with something that no one else has ever seen before and it gives them a massive technological advantage and allows them to just dominate a race. That's quite a big one. Yeah. And the other thing is it's also there to, to stop, well, the richer nations dominating too much in theory, where poorer nations, where their national federation, perhaps they don't have a big R&D budget to develop the Hope Lotus bike. It means that in theory, they should be able to buy the same equipment and therefore compete on a more level playing field. However, you would argue that this doesn't necessarily work because, well, the price of these things is still so outrageously <laughs> yeah. high, poorer nations still probably can't afford to use it. I can athletes. see like the idea behind it though, so that come race day, there's no massive surprises at say the Olympics, because nations have been able to see pictures online and the equipment has had to be used within competition within that certain time frame as well. But presumably there are going to be ways to get around this. Yeah, reach arounds. <laughs> Do you mean loopholes, fairly chance? Yeah. <laughs> UCI loopholes, that sounds a lot better. Mm. So the UCI is making companies make their bikes commercially available and they have to be technically for sale, mm. okay? But there's definitely gray areas. 100%. So if you look at the wording of the rule around pricing, it says that bikes and equipment have to be um, priced within a value that's reasonable for equipment of a similar level yeah and they can't like ridiculously exceed that you can interpret that how you like yes but what is what does that that's not a specific um, amount so it's almost as if you look at say a bike costing sixty thousand dollars it's like they've gone well we can't make it a hundred thousand dollars because that's probably too <laughs> that much. is ridiculous we can't justify that but what is the biggest a number that we can get away with yeah and it's like they've just gone more oh, 60 grand 60 grand it's yeah. like, it, that is the way it comes across, it's, that's the way. It does it feel like they've kind of almost just plucked it up and they presumably brands are going to argue, well, yeah, there's loads of research and development gone into it. And no doubt there is, it is a high performance piece of equipment. But whatever way you look at it, the, like just the materials, I'm sure it is an incredible grade of carbon fiber and I'm sure it's incredibly light and incredibly strong, but there's in no way, any way that I can see how you can justify $60,000 on a bike just when you start adding up the costs of it. Well, um, yeah, it would be difficult. I think <laughs> yeah. the, the other thing is with regards to the wording of the UCI rules of how it is commercially available, yeah. I can see a bit of a loophole in there. Okay. So it says that upon an order being placed, oh, yeah. there's, a, there's a time limit there of yeah. 30 days and yeah. then 90 days for the bike to Deliver. be delivered, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But what it doesn't say is like what happens before the order is placed. So clearly what's going on here is it's... That's the hold-up point. The hold-up point, yeah, is, is how easy it is to place that order in the first place. Well, we just proved, is like... I mean, we just tried for about 15 minutes and we couldn't speak to anyone that would process an order. Well, the fact that your order... <laughs> yeah, your order doesn't have to be... Pro well, it's not, it's not that. It's the fact that your order clearly does not have to be processed. Or if you're just sending an email to inquire on a website or yeah. you're doing whatever, you're, or, you know, they don't have to reply to you straight away, and there's there's the hold-up point there. Yeah, I mean, years ago, um, there was the UK SI bikes that people like Bradley Wiggins, Road to Victory and things like, World Time Trial Records, Olympic Gold, and that was kind of where some of this stuff started off, didn't it? They were using bikes which weren't really commercially available. Yes, so, yeah, if you remember back in the yeah, 2012 Olympics, yeah. and several Olympic cycles, 
Yeah, those those stealth out black bikes, yeah. but also the helmet uh, that was worn. So the helmet that Bradley Wiggins wore in twenty twelve in the time trial wasn't commercially available to buy. Yeah, they, um, they although like it technically was on the UK SI website if you could find it, but they were always kind of like out of stock. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just and say. outrageously priced as well. But we've done a little bit more research actually, and because the bike has got that UCI approved sticker on it. We have checked the UCI approved frames list, which is something that Ollie and I do regularly every evening before we kind of just go to bed. And not it would in the same bed. Not in the same bed, because that would be weird. Um, and basically, it's not on the list yet, which yeah. means presumably it's just that the UCI haven't actually updated the list rather yeah. than it's like a fake. Yeah, no, the UCI, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think they haven't updated their list yet, so it's not actually on there, but. Yeah. Well, there you have it. What do you think? Do you agree that it should be as difficult as it is to buy some of these crazy high bikes? Should the UCI clamp down on this reach around? I mean, loophole. And um, would you like it to actually be commercially available in terms of like, you have to be able to buy it now? Or if you can't I, order I it so. next day, it's not allowed? I think so. I think the, the, the UCI rule should be rewritten <laughs> so that if you can't buy it on Wiggle with next day delivery, you're not allowed to use it in competition or at the Olympics. All right, well, that's our thoughts on it. Please do share your <laughs> share your thoughts in the comments section down below. This is gonna be an interesting one. Well, no, in all seriousness though, hmm. there is like this bigger, wider argument here about leveling that playing field in terms of equipment for, yeah. for all nations. And while we do wanna see technological advancement and stuff, they, the UCI has made rules to try and make it a more level playing field, but it still seems that brands are sneaking around the rules yeah. or tr reading in between the lines and yeah. doing stuff. So yeah. hmm. I'm totally with you. Whilst we've had a bit of fun talking about it, it is a really important subject that I think basically means I want to see it as even as possible. Yeah. Hmm. Right, we're out of here. See you later.